If you spent any amount of time playing fighting games, you've probably stumbled across the concept of archetypes before. An archetype in fighting games is a way to categorize a character's general playstyle based on their moves. Every character fits into an archetype somehow, and they're a good way to figure out if you're going to like a character before you play them. If you know what you do and don't like in a character before going into a game, then you have a higher chance of finding the one for you right at the start. But what are the most common archetypes? What are the things that you should look out for with each of them? Which archetype should I play? Today, I want to help answer all of those other questions. So let's do that. Let's talk about fighting game archetypes. Shotos are the white bread of fighting games. The cheese on toast of the genre. The unseasoned chicken covered in tomato sauce. Wait a minute, that's just gross, what? They focus on one thing above everything else in their moveset. BALANCE! To be a Shoto is to be a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Shotos have a well-rounded moveset that focuses on allowing them to excel at every position on the screen. This is thanks to the three main tools that Shotos have. Tool number one, the Fireball. Fireball is a term used to describe any projectile that goes across the screen in fighting games, or sometimes just any projectile. Shotos generally have the most basic fireballs in their games. The most popular of these is the mid-screen, mid-speed, mid-damage, mid-reward fireball. Also known as the miss miss mid mirror these fireballs are generally good for advancing forward behind them, since they're not the fastest, but they still travel fast enough to be used to shut down the opponent's fireballs. If the opponent doesn't have a fireball that's good or better though, then they're able to use these to keep the opponents out easily and take control of the screen at longer ranges. The strength of the fireball depends on the game, of course. In the older Street Fighter games, fireballs were extremely oppressive, but now they're much more tame in comparison. And with characters like Kai in Guilty Gear Strive, a character whose fireball is the anime definition of Ms. 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 Mirror, is generally a means to an end, with it being a way to close out a round at longer distances, or a way to get his actual game plan rolling. Tool 2, the Dragon Punch. The most beloved of wake-up options. The Dragon Punch, DP for short, is an anti-air focus move which sits directly in front of the character. It has them fly upwards in the air and they generally scream out the name of the move. Hulken Vapor Flasto Inferno Divider Volcanico Viper! Depending on the game, this has the added benefit of making the character fully invincible while they use it. Nowadays, it's generally got some caveats to it, being that only certain DPs have invincibility while you use them, or you have to spend a resource to make it invincible. However, they all still work as really good anti-airs to twat your opponent out of the sky. DPs give you exactly what they say they do on the tin. They're good ways to get your opponent out of the sky, and they're good ways to stop people from hitting you with a meaty. They're also a great option if you're a psychopath and think you can see gaps in the matrix. Tool 3, the Tatsu. Tatsus are moves that allow the player to avoid or pass through most projectile attacks. Like all of these terms, they originate from Street Fighter, specifically Ryu and Ken's Tatsumaki Senpyukyaku, also known as their Hurricane Kick. This move advances them forward and allows them to pass through fireballs. Now, this is generally the thing that changes the most between different Shodos. Obviously, you still have the ones that go forward and through fireballs, but some of them only go through mid and high up fireballs. Some of them don't go through fireballs at all and instead act as a mix-up tool or combo extender, and some of them just... Uh... Are we sure that this is a Tatsu at this point? But as long as it sends them forwards and they can avoid some attacks, bonus points of his fireballs, then we generally class it as a Tatsu. Those are the three main tools that Shodos have that allow them to perform well in basically every matchup. By having tools that allow them to keep their opponent away, get in on their opponents, and keep them out of the air, they're able to control most sections of the screen extremely well, and adjust their strategies in order to beat their opponents. It's all about that balance, being able to do a little bit of everything, but not exactly excelling at one specific thing. But that doesn't mean that every Shoto is the same. No, like everything in life, the best ones have a little bit of spice to them. Sure, you got your basic Street Fighter 2 bland chicken Ryu, but... 
He could add some chili flakes and suddenly he got a Street Fighter 6 Ken. A character who doesn't have a tattoo that can go through fireballs, but gains the ability to pressure the opponent with crazy kicks and devastating run combos. Add some sriracha sauce and then you got a soul bad guy. A Shono who's got a really good tattoo and a command grab, but shorter range fireballs that's more used for pressure. Or maybe you're looking for something else on the other end of the spectrum. I want something that can work better at longer ranges. Sprinkle a little bit of garlic on that shit and you get a Melly Blood type Luminous CL. A character who excels at longer ranges, but is able to quickly convert them into getting into their opponent's face. Hell, even Ryu got at least some pepper on him in Street Fighter 6, being able to empower his fireballs for better zoning and pressure. Shoto's are all about one thing above everything else though. BALANCE! A Shoto is able to do everything, but never excels in one particular thing. Granted, the more you try to change them, the less they seem to resemble a Shoto. But as long as they have the balance toolkit, then they can say that they're a Shoto. You just gotta find the right blend of Shoto spice for you. And if you pick Kai, that means you eat unseasoned raw chicken straight out of the packet. You salmonella-loving freak! All right, now that we can move past the well-mannered people who spend all of their time meditating and trying to reach enlightenment, and soul bad guy, it's time to move on to the big three archetypes. These are the baseline that every archetype draws on in some way or another. Each of them are separated into their own different camps, and while there is definitely some overlap, most of the time, if you play one type of these characters, you fucking hate the rest of them. They are constantly at war with each other. And the Shodos. And the rest of the cast. And the FGC at large. You know, maybe making a community that's based entirely around beating each other up hasn't been the best idea. So let's see which of them I should talk about first. Fuck! Are you the kind of person to see two big burly men throwing each other around and react with... Damn, that's hot. Damn, that's cool. Do you love seeing a person who's more muscled than human screaming about how they're gonna beat the shit out of someone in a way that makes zero sense to anyone? If we used to go one-on-one -on -one and then add 66 and two-thirds percents, I got 141 and two-thirds chance of winning at sacrifice. See, Joe. The numbers don't lie! Does seeing someone grab another person, lift them in the air, scream something that has to do with how they're going to drop them, and then drop them to the ground, cause all of the neurons in your brain to fire at the same time? Well then, you'd probably be interested in learning a grappler. Grapplers are focused on one thing above everything else. Grab! Usually being big and slow, grapplers are a very burst-heavy character archetype who take a long time to get into the position that they want. But once they are in, they deal an absolutely ludicrous amount of damage by using their signature move, the Command Grab. In most fighting games, there are two types of grabs. There are regular grabs, and there are command grabs. Regular grabs are available to the entire cast, and can generally be teched by pressing your grab right as you get grabbed. Sometimes the window is extremely tight, and sometimes it's not even there. But these are throws that every character in the cast has access to. Command grabs are unique to specific characters, and have to be executed by doing a special motion input. Or in some games, they are tied to a special move button. We call this bit future-proofing for Project L because they remove motion inputs. Why? I don't know, they fucking hate me, I guess. Normally, these are massive grabs that send the opponent flying in the air in some way and do a bunch of damage once they finally come crashing down. Sometimes this resets the match to neutral, sometimes the grappler is able to stay in the opponent's face and continue their pressure, and sometimes it's not just one grab, but multiple grabs, and the player is able to chain them together in order to make you regret your life choices. A lot of people out there always think it's just the one grab, and while the most popular grapplers out there are big guy with big grab, there's always some grapplers who will mix up the formula like- But what else makes a grappler? Like, it can't just be that they have a command grab. That would be silly. Uh, shit. Well, there's multiple different things that define what makes them who they are. And it's definitely not just because of the name. Like, uh, Moo. 
movement! Grapplers are always pretty notorious for not having good ways of closing the gap against their opponents. They generally either have no good movement options at all, or their movement options are extremely committal and leave them open to being punished in a variety of ways. Maybe this is something like Potemkin's hammerfall in Strive, which caused him to fly forwards in a straight line. While he can armor through some of the attacks that he takes, it is a predictable straight line, and it always leaves him negative when the move is ending. Meaning he has to call out the opponent while using this move if he wants to get in. Or you can just spam it and hope for the best. Or something like Zangief's running bear grab, a command grab that has him run forward in a straight line for a few seconds. The move has such a long style that players are able to see it, process it, and react to it. But it can be a good call-out move if you know that your opponent is going to backdash or if they're not paying that much attention. Grapplers get worse and worse the further away you are from them. And if your character has even a semi-decent tool at keeping them at bay from further reaches of the screen, they can be put in a position where they're not even able to try and play the game. They just get shut down over and over and over and over again. Constantly being forced to reflect on their decisions and what led them to this point in life. A life of never-ending torment, where all they can do is slowly attempt to push the boulder up the hill with no hope of ever getting to the top. Oh, look at that, I won. The grapplers also tend to have the added benefit of being absolute fucking tanks. They have this miraculous ability to get hit over and over and over again and still keep in the fight. Unlike other archetypes, they can deal with the damage that they also dish out. They're like glass cannons that are not made of glass. So a cannon. Grapplers generally have very, very high total health pools, meaning that they're able to take hits over and over again and still manage to stay standing. Situations that would leave other punier characters in the grave matter not to grapplers, as they are able to survive more situations. Finally, a lot of the fully dedicated grapplers tend to be absolutely massive when compared to the rest of the cast. Grapplers tend to have massive frames with big attacks that hit hard mid-range. And most of the time, especially on launch, they're generally the biggest characters in their games. This gives them some control of the mid-screen and allows for them to push advantages or even whiff punish pretty effectively. Though this does come with a downside, and it's a pretty big one. Since their whole bodies are bigger, they're a lot easier to hit when compared to other characters. In some games, this can mean that these characters have combos that can only be done on them because of the way that their hurtboxes are. Certain attacks that would whiff on shorter characters with slimmer frames can hit the big meaty boys, such as the life of being swole as fuck. This can naturally counterbalance the health benefits that grapplers have. Since they take harder hitting and longer combos, they generally lose more health from basic combos. And that's grapplers. They're big, they take big damage, they deal bigger damage, and most importantly, they grab. Zoning is the act of using a long-ranged attacks to try and prevent your opponent from coming closer, typically by using long distance normals, fireballs, and backwards movement. It's an extremely potent strategy that most players will use at some point in their fighting game career. Sometimes it's worth it just sitting at the other end of the screen and peppering your opponent with fireballs and longer range attacks in order to end their life without putting yourself at too much risk. It happens sometimes, but could you imagine playing like that for the entire game, the whole match? You just sit at the end of the screen, sending out fireballs and long-ranged attacks as your opponent slowly tries to get in. What kind of monster would willingly do this constantly to other real people, no less? Zoners are characters who are entirely focused on zoning the opponent out and interacting as little as possible. Zoners focus on having long-reaching normal attacks, strong, far-hitting projectiles, or sometimes, in the worst-case scenario, having both at the exact same fucking time. Zoners are the antithesis of grapplers, as the further away you get from them, the stronger they generally become. This isn't always the case, though. Some zoners are able to play a stronger game while being at mid-screen, as they've got good tools to keep your opponent at bay at that range, but the tools fall off pretty quickly the further you go out. Think of someone like Guile from Street Fighter. His sonic boom is very strong, but 
because of the charge, it doesn't always have the same amount of kick depending on the matchup that you play. Now, zoning is not really something that I like, and I've been very harsh on zoners in the past. However, for the sake of education and fairness, I'll try to be as neutral on zoners as I can for this section. The zoning hate is justified, though, because the whole point of zoning is to annoy the opponent as much as possible into making a mistake. The end goal isn't to kill them with fireball spam, though if they die, hey, good for you, right? It's to force them to make stupid decisions that lead to their downfall. It's a sort of primal rage that comes out in most people while they're getting zoned in fighting games. A panic sets in as the clock ticks onwards, your health bar slowly lowering, the enemy gaining resource after resource with no opening in sight until eventually you feel like you have no choice but to do something ridiculous and drastic. And it's in these moments where zoners shine. Zoners tend to have two different types of tools. There's zoning tools that work in most situations and cover a lot, but not all, options, and the more specific tools which cover less options, but the options that they do cover, they cover really, really well. They might have a lot of things that cover the enemy on the ground and keep them sat on the floor, but they're beaten by simply jumping over them. It's in times like this where they pull out their special weapon, the Fuck You Get anti aired Gun, which hits players jumping directly at them really hard and makes you infertile or some shit. I don't know, I don't play Zoners. The act of playing the Zoner is like being the mastermind in an anime. Predicting your opponent's next move is vital in order to succeed as a Zoner. You need to watch how your opponent reacts closely and carefully, analyzing everything they do until eventually predictable. Fuck. It's all well and good trying to predict your opponent, but if you get it wrong, you're not gonna like what happens next. Zoners tend to suck the moment that you get past their preferred range. While their normals hit very far, they normally end up being really slow. Plus, most of the time, they have weak defensive tools, which don't allow them to get opponents off of them once they're finally in. This isn't always the case, as some zoners have very, very good defensive tools. However, they normally have a downside that needs to be overcome. With someone like Guile, who has a very good reversal with his flash kick, it needs to be charged, meaning that he needs a little bit of foresight in order to use it effectively. Plus, you can bait it by having him block an overhead so he loses the charge. Or with someone like JP, who has a counter move, but he can be thrown out of it. Wait, what do you mean that if he uses the OD version, it also beats Froze? Wait, hold on. A lot of the time, though, weak defense and pretty mid health bars are staples of Zoners. I definitely didn't say grapplers in the original recording. They're amazing at keeping you out, but once you're in on them, they tend to just kind of crumble into dust. This doesn't mean I like fighting them, I fucking hate them. Zoners are not for everyone, but if you really just wanted to play a single player game and love frustrating your opponents, then you'll probably really enjoy them. In all seriousness though, Zoners bring a wholly unique perspective to fighting games that isn't just running and brawl with your opponents. Besides, what kind of moron would want to play a character that's just entirely based of rushing in on your opponent and forcing them to constantly guess in order to get a chance to play the game again? Rushdown is the most baller archetype there is, because it's the one that I like, and that's all the logic that I need in order to boast about it. Rushdown is a playstyle which involves running at your opponent and hitting them with as many attacks as you can right in front of their face until they inevitably die. Following that logic, Rushdown characters are characters that excel at being in front of their opponents and have a lot of tools in order to deal big damage and most importantly, make that combo counter go up and up and up. Well, isn't that just grappler? I mean, they have the same preferred range according to you. Why are you like this? The difference between grapplers and rushdown characters are pretty obvious once you look past the opening statements. And it boils down to two main factors. How the characters approach their opponents and what they do once they're finally in. Let's talk about those approach tools really quickly. Generally, rushdown characters end up doing something that we haven't seen yet from the other archetypes, and that's crank the speed up. Now, most of you will be thinking of movement speed, and you are correct with saying that, but more importantly, rushdown characters also attack faster than most of the cast. 
This means they have attacks that come out really quickly and recover really quickly, which can lead to them having some of the best close range buttons in the game. However, the downside becomes that the characters tend to have stubbier buttons. While most other archetypes have a nice gradient for their effective range, a lot of rushdown characters just fall off once you leave mid-screen. Hell, they might even have no good tools once you get past the range where you can smell their breath. This doesn't matter too much for a lot of rushdown characters, though. Thanks to their speed, they have a lot of ways to get into that preferred range much easier. This can be through their walk, run, or dash speeds, but a lot of time, rushdown characters have other tools that allow them to get in on their opponent. A lot of times, rushdown characters will have some sort of dash that goes forward. Moves like this are very common on rushdown characters and sometimes have added benefits. You obviously have your ones that just get you in but leave you negative. You have ones that might have a bit of longer startup but will leave you positive in front of your opponent in its face and then you have some that are just fuck it we ball go in and it does something we still don't know nobody knows so congratulations you pressed your special move and now you're in on the opponent i'm so proud of you but what can you do now it's not like you have a command grab to destroy your opponent's health bar in one clean hit Please don't look at that. The likelihood is that you have the ability to do one of a multiple different options that can all be beaten in different ways. We call these mix-up situations. Why is it called a mix-up? Because the opponent has to mix up the way that they're blocking? Fuck you, I don't know. Do I look like the fighting game glossary to you? Mix-ups are common across every archetype, but rushdown characters thrive with them, generally having multiple layered mix-ups that all fit on top of each other in different ways. The basic mix-ups are strike-throw mix-ups, mix-ups in which the opponent is either gonna hit you or they're gonna throw you. High-low mix-ups, mix-ups where the opponent will either hit you with a low or an overhead attack, and finally, left right mix-ups. Mix-ups where the opponent can either hit you with an attack on the left side or an attack on the right side. Mix-ups with two options where the way that your opponent is going to hit you is ambiguous and hard to figure out are generally called 50-50s. However, if there are multiple options, players will simply refer to them with how many options there are. So a mix-up that can have the opponent hit with a high, a low, or a throw would be referred to as a freeway mix-up. Every archetype has different mix-ups, but rushdown characters easily have the the best mix-ups, and a lot of cases have mix-ups that lead to more mix-ups if the opponents block the first one. A lot of rushdown characters are able to use tools in order to constantly force their opponent to guess, and will create sequences where the next option that the opponent goes for is unclear and not easy to deal with. By having access to a lot of fast hitting moves that all require the opponent to beat them in different ways, rushdown characters are able to overwhelm their opponents with different options and situations until they inevitably remove the veil and beat you with some Something so simple, you're confused on if you're even fighting the same player or not. But wait, there's more! Because Rushdown characters aren't always just focusing on mixing you up at every opportunity. No! Some have gained the ultimate ability that every archetype wishes for, removing your ability to play the game. Without going too much into the course concept of how fighting games work, some Rushdown characters have pressure and sequences that allow them to constantly be in a state where they can do whatever they want and you can do nothing! You lose! We refer to this as being plus, and just know the more plus you are, the better the outcome. Alternatively, the more negative you are, the worse the outcome. Some Rushdown characters have the ability to make themselves extremely plus, basically all of the time, meaning that every opportunity turns from a, oh god, how are they gonna mix me, to, I gotta get out of here! This is where frame traps come in. Basically, if you have a button that comes out too long for it to actually keep the opponent in a block string, but fast enough for where they can't hit a button between it, it's called a frame trap. Some Rushdown characters thrive over this and have huge, absolutely massive combos off of the counter hits that they get from these frame traps. So what's the downside then? If they're so cool and perfect, why do you marry them? I mean, what are their weaknesses? Well, as I said earlier, some Rushdown characters don't have the luxury of long-hitting normals and neutral tools. So once you get them even slightly out of their effective range, they have to hard commit if they want to get back into a winning position. Also, the faster ones tend to have smaller health pools than the rest of the cast, so once you hit them, they just kind of crumble like Grandpa's ashes in the wind. 
Order now, gamersubs.com. Code he's getting for 10% off. They've got a new heaven and hell waifu cup, and it's got like demons and shit on it. Get it now! Get it now! Well, stock slice! It's a general trade for rushdown characters. You either get high mobility and good mix up, but no HP, or you trade good mix ups and good mobility for more HP. And if you find a character with all three, then, well, there's a good chance that you have a top tier on your hands. Rushdown characters are so much fun. I love them. They're amazing. I might marry them, actually. Sure, they're probably not for everyone, but for me and other people who love bashing their heads against their peripherals, they're extremely fun. And just forcing your opponent to constantly guess or else they die is really satisfying. I love them. You hopefully don't hate them. And they're the best archetype. Fuck you. Now, the best bit about fighting games is that the characters are all uniquely designed. You don't start developing a character and can't add things because that would deviate from the archetype, naughty developer. That doesn't work, Mr. Developer! Don't make me throw you into the dumpster, developer! No, in fact, all of these definitions are malleable and contain a bunch of other archetypes that were created because the FGC is full of smart, hot, funny people who just love randomly putting labels on everything. Because of this, several sub-archetypes have shown up between the big three, where their strengths merge and their weaknesses also merge, I guess. So let's go through some of the most common ones to show up from this. The combo grappler is just like a grappler, however, there's one noticeable difference. Instead of having the command grab do a bunch of damage, it leaves the opponent in a situation where they are open for a completely free combo. By allowing for a free combo after the command grab lands, instead of doing a bunch of damage, combo grapplers are able to get potentially more off of their command grabs than normal grapplers. Normal grapplers with normal command grabs have a fixed result after the enemy is hit with them. Combo grapplers, though, are able to change their combo in order to get whatever they would like out of it. Maybe there's a combo from command grab that gives the player a mix-up after they land. Maybe there's one that does a lot of damage. Maybe there's one that gives you both, but it's very hard to execute. Or maybe there's just one that lets you cash out everything you have to do an ungodly amount of damage. By allowing the player to do a combo, the character opens up to a bunch of different opportunities for new and creative creative sequences when compared to normal grapplers. However, there has to be a trade-off, right? Well, ignoring the new execution of having to press more buttons, combo grapplers have a habit of keeping the bad parts of grapplers' movements without the benefit of ridiculously large health bars. And since they're getting the high damaging combos and potential mix-ups from the rushdown characters, they don't get any of the good movement tools, generally just the really slow and committal ones. There's a chance they do have a better approach option compared to traditional grapplers, but a lot of the time, it's very committal. Like, she's not leaving that stance, bro. She's gonna go in. Eventually. A very fun archetype, especially since they normally have very silly combos. The Footsies character is a character that focuses on one thing above everything else. Footsies. For those of you out of the loop, footsies is a term that refers to controlling the space in front of you, often by using pokes. In essence, you're trying to get to a range that you like, while trying to deny your opponent from getting to a range that they like. Footsie characters then are characters with a lot of really good mid-range pokes, who focus on beating the enemy by converting off of a poke for big damage. These characters rely a lot on whiff punishing and baiting the opponent into doing an option when they really shouldn't have done it. However, they tend to only really be good at playing footsies. Obviously, when they're directly in front of your face, they can have some good buttons, but their actual pressure can be somewhat lacking when compared to their rushdown counterparts, and they don't have any long long-range buttons like fireballs or full-screen normals. They dominate the mid-range, but nowhere else. I haven't scripted this bit, so, um, it's gonna be fun. So you know how, like, the strength of the Zona is they get to sit at full screen and basically do whatever they want and you have to react to it? The benefit of the Rushdown character is they're able to get in really easily and mix your shit. And the benefit of the Grappler is they're fucking huge, have a lot of armor, and do a bunch of damage. Now imagine you take all of those good things and you put them on one character. And the downside is... Yeah. That's Z Broly, a character whose key blast is so fucking good that he's just able to sit at the other end of the screen. If you try to super dash for it, which is what you do against key blast, uh, you get command grabbed and died. He's able to go into armored stances that take you to the corner and fucking kill you. He has ridiculous combo conversions and he's fucking stupid. If you want to know what every archetype in a trench coat going to Wendy's and trying to order a Baconator looks like, go play Z Broly.
All right, now that we got that absolute monster out of the way, we can go on to some of the weirder archetypes. The characters that we just talked about managed to cover the majority of fighting game archetypes. Generally, a character can be described as a rushdown, a zoner, or a grappler. Of course, they could also be a Shodo, but Shodos tend to move towards one of the three other archetypes, depending on what they specialize in. The next few archetypes more focus around the gimmicks that each character has. These are extremely impactful to how the character functions. Stance characters are characters that have a stance. Listen, I swear it gets more interesting. Stance characters can be pretty simple or pretty complex depending on how their stance works. However, for the most part, stance characters are able to enter a new stance that forces them to have new moves. For example, Leia White Fang is a basic stance character who has a stance that increases his rushdown potential. By running through the opponent, he gets a full new set of moves but loses the ability to block. For him, his stance is more of a win condition than something to augment his kit. Stances can sometimes be much simpler though. Some characters like Johnny from Guilty Gear have to enter a stance in order to do some of their attacks. During this attack, he is able to either let it go or cancel it by pressing heavy slash. This is known as stance cancelling, and in older Guilty Gear games, he can give himself frame advantage, but in Strive, he just gets sick combo. But this isn't the kind of stance character that you want to know about. No, you want to hear about Lei Wulong, the stance character with seven different stances that you need to learn. You'll literally get put into a different stance every time you sidestep. Imagine sidestepping to move left to punish something, and now you have a completely different character with a different kit. I'm sure that's fun. I don't know anything else about Lei Wulong, so we're moving on. The stance character generally lands on a scale of complexity with how their stances function. But normally, they either have stances that keep their gameplay style, or even enhance it, or they have a stance that completely changes their gameplay style, and the archetype that they're in to be even funkier. Stance characters are simple in concept, but can be endlessly complex in execution. A puppet character is a character who controls another smaller character on the screen that isn't themselves. Like most archetypes, this has some different types, but let's focus on the big puppet characters who control a puppet with a lot of different possible actions. These kind of characters basically have a completely separate character on their screen that they're able to manipulate and control by doing specific special moves, button commands, or even moving around the screen. Generally because they have the ability to control a secondary character, they have a lot of benefits like being able to completely skip neutral, or keep you in a block string that's longer than most actual games in a versus fighter. The downside generally is that once you find to get rid of their secondary character, they, uh, they kind of suck. On their own, the characters have pretty stubby normals, crap mix-ups, non-existent pressure, and the health bar of an actual child. Oh, wait, hold on. Generally, this extra character allows for puppet characters to do a bunch of different things in a bunch of different playstyles. They can be a puppet zoner, using their extra character to keep the opponent as far away from them as possible, essentially creating an actual wall of obstacles that their opponent needs to pass through if they want to win. Or they can be a rushdown puppet character, using their extra character in order to keep you locked down in place while they mix you up or have their puppet work with them in order to hit you from angles you didn't expect to be hit from. They can also keep you glued to them without any hope of escaping. I haven't really seen a puppet grappler though, and I'm extremely happy about that fact. Is that Kanji from the hit game Persona 4? Hear me out though. What if we took the massive secondary character, scaled them down a little bit, make them less impactful, but give the base character some other benefits, like making it so they could actually spawn multiple of the little guys, or even making them an actual character who can function without their puppet, and boom! You have a puppet light character. These kind of characters share a lot of the benefits of puppet characters, but tend to have less impactful downsides. Their only downside is either that they require more setup if they want to get as effectively working as the other puppet characters, or they simply can't get to those crazier setups and have to win more interactions with more honest pressure. Either way, puppet characters are really cool, if you're the one playing them. Alright, so you know how grapplers tend to have a lot of health and massive hitboxes while having hurt boxes that are bigger than the rest of the cast? Well, what if we took that kind of character and just removed the command grab? Big body characters are huge characters with massive health pools that do a bunch of damage but have the downside of being generally really slow. The difference between big bodies and grapplers is 
Honestly, not too much. But not every grappler is a big body, and not every big body is a grappler. For the most part, big body characters use a lot of big hitting normals and powerful pressure tools to either commit to an approach option or to keep their opponent locked down so more pressure could come their way. A lot of the time, big body characters can be described as bullies, making you constantly second guess what you should do next or how you should react to their pressure with hard hitting moves and insane plus frames. Obviously, that downside is their speed. Not being able to easily get into that game-winning position can lead to a lot of sticky situations for them. But they have the health bars to be able to weather the storms. And once they finally get in, it can feel like the game just sort of ends right there and then. Set play is a concept that describes calculated pre-planned setups, most commonly found on a knockdown. It involves a lot of different ideas in it, however, most commonly, this is found on OK Zeme, also known as a wake-up situation or a knockdown. Set play characters, then, are characters that excel at set play situations and base their entire game plans around these different situations. Most of the time, this is by putting some sort of attack on top of the opponent while they wake up. And this then allows them to do a mix-up as soon as the opponent wakes up. Set play characters can feel like they're playing a single player game sometimes, since they're entirely focused on running pre-planned setups. Once they get you into a position that's favorable to them, they're able to force you to guess which one of their several options is coming next. And you have to either react or sometimes just straight up guess what's going to happen. For a lot of set play characters, being able to find the hit that gets them in their game winning position is the hardest part. If they're not able to get you into a knockdown state or God forbid, win neutral against you, they tend to struggle pretty hard. This can be with things like poor neutral options, low damage from non knockdown situations, or it could be things like having basically no health. So if they're not running their pressure, then they're just dying. Now, we can sit here all day and go over every single possible archetype from every single possible fighting game. Archetypes are the kind of thing that you can just keep adding labels to stuff if you really want to. Archetypes are a good baseline for what a character plays like and what tools they have. However, that's all it is. A baseline. Characters in different games all play differently and have different tools at their disposal, so trying them out will give you a better sense of what they're actually going to play like. Hell, it varies so much that sometimes characters in the same franchise play completely differently in different games. It helps narrow down what characters are like and what to expect, but every character is different and unique, and that's what makes fighting games so fun to learn and play. If I missed your favorite archetype, let me know about it in the comment section below, or just gush about your favorite character. Thanks for watching, go play fighting games, and I'll see you all next week. As always, a very special thanks to 64 MHz, Almost Nap Time, Ben from Canada, Cervantes de Leon, Daniel Wiederich, Fexo, Games.png, I am Naoto, MP04, Ray W, Richmine, Sergeant Cubby, Super, Falcon, Tom Tanks, Voltaic Charge, and Zandatsu, being tier 2 patron supporters.